Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Wednesday, September 21st, 2022. In news this week, Russian President Vladimir Putin announced he's recalling up to 300,000 reservists and military veterans to fight in the war in Ukraine. My opinion, this shows just how desperate the situation is for Putin. Up till now, he's wanted to distance the Russian populace from any impacts of the war but recalling 300,000 reservists and veterans means the Kremlin can no longer hide just how badly things are going. And a recent video showing a mercenary from the Wagner Group talking to convicts in a Russian prison, promising them amnesty after six months of frontline service is just another sign of, of desperation uh, in Moscow. Here at Annapolis at the Naval Institute, we just finished the October issue of Proceedings, our annual submarine and undersea warfare focused issue. And we're working hard on the November, December issue of Naval History. We have a number of Naval Institute events and conferences coming up. All of them are open to the public. On 29 September here in Annapolis, Biliana Lilly, the author of Russian Information Warfare, Assault on Democracies in the Cyber Wild West, will be talking uh, on the stage of the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center. On 11 October, Vice Admiral Brad Cooper, the commander of Fifth Fleet, will be speaking at the U.S. Coast, Coast Guard Academy part of an ongoing series of Naval Institute sponsored speakers at the Coast Guard Academy. On 14 October, here at the Naval Institute, the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center will be hosting Vice Admiral Carl Thomas, the commander of Seventh Fleet, talking about what's happening out in the Western Pacific and with China these days. And on 25 October, we'll be hosting the Naval Academy, Naval Institute Annual Applied History Conference, which is titled the Russia-China Partnership, a challenge to the new world order. And uh, key law, keynote speakers for that event are Dr. Hal Brands and Dr. George Freeman. It, it promises to be an amazing event. You can find details about all the Naval Institute events upcoming at usni.org forward slash events. Now let's get to our guest. Uh, so my guest today is my former co-host, my former wingman and, and founder of the Naval Institute Proceedings Podcast, Ward Carroll. Many of you have missed Ward of late because he went into semi-retirement from the Institute about a year ago after his YouTube channel, the Ward Carroll channel, went gangbusters. As of last week, Ward is now retired from the Naval Institute and focusing solely on his YouTube channel, his rock band, and he also has a new granddaughter. Uh, for those who are relatively new to the show, Ward is a retired Navy commander, Naval Academy class of 1982. He was an F-14 Tomcat radar intercept officer in the Navy a life member of the Naval Institute, proceedings author, novelist, and our former director of outreach and marketing. He's also a great friend, shipmate, and wingman. Ward, welcome back. This is you, Ward Carroll. Oh, that's very weird. Yeah. So it's great to be here, beaming in from about two miles away from you in my attic, where I will spend the rest of eternity. <laughs> now that I've decided to be a YouTuber full-time. Uh, so, Ward, just uh, recap for our listeners how you first got involved with the Naval Institute. You've been a life member for about uh, over 30 years now. Um, so the first time I saw proceedings, which is kind of everybody's entryway into the Naval Institute, was at home. My father was a career Marine Corps attack pilot. He was a member back when I was young and, and you know, the covers were very cool. So I'd thumb check it as a young boy, very interested in, in airplanes and building models and World War II history and all that sort of thing. And every once in a while, an article would jump out at me, even as a middle schooler that, that I would read. And so that was my first sort of awareness of the existence of certainly proceedings. And like most folks in passing, sometimes we have trouble connecting proceedings to the Naval Institute. So fast forward through the Naval Academy, through my first squadron tour in VF-32, I was the editor of Approach Magazine at the Naval Safety Center and also flying with the aggressor squadron over to Oceana. The guy I relieved, maybe some of the viewers know, uh, Dave Hajo Parsons, another Tomcat Rio, I relieved him as the editor proceedings and he had befriended a uh, sort of Svengali of both of ours, Fred Rainbow. Fred is the longtime editor or was the longtime editor of Proceedings, uh, the lamplighter for many folks over the years. And so we're at Tailhook 1989. 
and I'm running the, the Naval Safety Center booth at Tailhook. And this is back when Tailhook was at Las Vegas. So we're out on the veranda, just uh, sort of networking. And Dave goes, hey, here's Fred Rainbow. I've told you about him. You've got to meet him. <clears throat> so in the course of one conversation, Fred signed me up for about three different things. One is be a member of the Naval Institute. And two and three were write articles for proceedings on these things that you've just teed up during this conversation. And so that was my way in. And uh, as you mentioned, I've, I've been a, I, I'm not a life member, but I've been a member, uh, you know, year to year, three year chunks ever since then. Yeah. Fred was a genius at that. He would meet Naval officers, have a great conversation with them. They'd tell them, uh, they'd tell Fred his ideas and then he would say, Hey, that would make a great proceedings article. And, you know, suddenly you're a lieutenant and you've been tasked by the editor in chief, or at least it felt like you've been tasked to write something. And so off it goes. Uh, so when was your first proceedings article and what was it about? My first proceedings article was, uh, I want to say, and this is a Dennis, Dennis Clift question, right? Our, our, our Gandalf who knows every issue of proceedings. Our Gandalf, um, yes. Yeah. So it was in 1993. I want to say January of 1993. I was a RAG instructor. I was an instructor at VF 101. Um, and through a, a telephone conversation with Fred, because here I am in Virginia Beach, Fred's in Annapolis. This is before the internet. Um, I was complaining about uh, the Navy's recruiting slash public affairs overall look. And, and I said, it's time for the communications mechanism to act more like a corporation in terms of promoting the Navy. And uh, so I, it got wide play, like every article of any consequence does in proceedings, um, including the guy who was Chinfo at the time called Fred and, and complained about it, which Fred took as a... Uh, a measure of effectiveness in, in a very uniquely Fred way. So I was, I don't want to say I was hooked, but I saw immediately through the first, you know, 1500 word effort, the, what can happen when you're published in proceedings. And so from that moment forward, ultimately I was published in proceedings eight times from 93 through 02. And that includes uh, first serial release of my novel that was published originally by Naval Institute Press. Punk's War was published by Naval Institute Press in 01 when I was still on active duty. And so this is sort of the, you know, multi-headed threat that the Naval Institute is. When you have a book coming out, you can sort of tease it out in the pages of proceedings if it's relevant. And, you know, so that, that, that sort of my initial uh, entry was that article or my initial feedback was that article. And, you know, I've been involved in a myriad ways uh, since then. Cool. So uh, uh, Top Gun Maverick is, you know, getting a lot of attention these days. We were just out at uh, Tailhook a couple weeks ago. They were talking about the making of that movie, which is now three years in the past because they held it because of COVID. Uh, obviously, the original Top Gun featured F-14s and, you know, Maverick and Goose. And uh, you were an F-14 Rio, as you like to tell people. You know, that I've, I've seen you tell this to thousands of plebes. You'll say, you know, the movie Top Gun, there's Maverick and Goose, I was Goose. That's what that's what Ward would always say. Uh, so you were, you were flying that aircraft at the height of its fame, right, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, so what were some of the best attributes of the F-14 and, and what were some of its drawbacks? So the best attributes of the airplane are the way it sort of morphed from strictly air-to-air -air platform to strike fighter over the course of its life. So whatever the Navy or the nation needed the F-14 to do, it was able to do. So it was built against the Soviet bomber threat, bears, badgers, carrying AS-4s that could fire at the carrier strike group from long ranges. So we needed an airplane to go farther and shoot missiles farther than the F-4 could, and that was the F-14. So for the first 20 years of its existence, um, that's what it did. And then as the Iron Curtain fell, as the Soviet Union split up, and we pivoted against other, let's say, asymmetric threats, Desert Storm 1, and particularly 
Afghanistan and Iraq, the post 9-11 threats, it demanded that the carrier air wing morph from something that had all of these platforms that could do one job into platforms that could do at least two jobs. And so basically the A6 went away, the S3 went away, some other ELINT platforms went away, and the Tomcat was made into a first a dumb bomber and then a precision bomber as the Hornet came online. So I'm very proud and 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 you know proud of the airplane really and the community that made this happen. And when we strapped the lantern pod on the side of the F-14 or attach it to the F-14, that just changed everything from 1995 through 2006 when the airplane was retired. So that that's kind of the first thing that comes to mind is that airplane's agility. The second thing that comes to mind is just how rewarding it was to be in an F-14 squadron. And, you know, I think of all the pilots and Rios I served with. The Navy was very good to me in that I was in pretty much nothing but Tomcat squadrons until I finished up teaching at the Naval Academy for the last tour on active duty. And so there was a lot of underway time. Um, and there was a lot of flight ups. And, and, you know, as I said, I was able to serve with these very talented aviators, pilots and Rios, but also the maintainers that I got to serve with. Uh, because the F-14, as it went on in years, became, let's just call it more of a challenge to maintain, the maintenance master chiefs and the work center supervisors and the other pit officer first class and above in a fighter squadron were all franchise players. They were known throughout the flight line. Skippers would recruit them and, and uh, you know, try to put your team together before you're going on deployment. So these guys knew how to keep that airplane airborne. And they were also fantastic leaders. And being allowed to watch them in action just taught me a lot about what it meant to be an officer, but also what it meant to be a leader. So, you know, you can see the plaques on the wall here of my various squadrons. Each one of those is a source of great pride. So that I was able to do that for as many years, basically I was in fighter squadrons for 16 of my 20 years on active duty, um, was an absolute gift. Great points. Yeah, great points about the the maintenance team that keep those airplanes flying. And as you point out, I remember being on carriers and towards the end of that airplane's life, it, it there was a lot of discussion at the CAG staff level about you know just how hard it was getting parts and keeping those airplanes uh, alive and running. Yeah, as, as is true with anything, any machine that gets old and is, has been worn hard and you know put away wet. Uh, so your first novel, you mentioned it a few minutes ago, Punk's War, published by the Naval Institute, 2001. Uh, it's been described by some as Tom Clancy meets Joseph Heller, Heller, the author of Catch-22. How'd you come up with that story? Well, that was Ron Chambers, who was the publisher at that time, uh, a job that Adam Kane has now. So I think what that hook is trying to connote is, you know, it's, it's a thriller on one hand, but it's also sort of a human study on the other hand. So the way I write, in fact, I, I started writing what turned out to be Punk's War. Uh, the working title was What Punks Do. Uh, I started writing that during my, uh, my second fleet tour in VF-143 in the early 90s. And I had a gigantic, you know, first gen computer stuck into my stateroom desk. The, the screen filled the entire opening of my stateroom desk. I drove my roommate, Charlie Edmondson, crazy because I'd be tapping away at all hours trying to get this thing, you know, fleshed out. Um, and, and so um, the idea was, as I was reading, you know, all of the popular techno thriller writers. I was like, they know how to do action. They know how to do world on the brink, but what they're not doing to my satisfaction, to my eye is capturing the people who are in fighter squadrons, particularly, or the Navy for that matter. So naively enough, I was hoping to explore that against the backdrop of, let's just call it a techno thriller. So that's what that Joseph Heller is, you know, that Catch-22 is, is a great human study. I would read it every time during the transit on our way to go on cruise because it would sort of set my 
head right for what was about to happen for the next six months. And then Clancy, obviously, is the standard bearer, first published at the Naval Institute, right, 1984. Hunt for Red October was published by the Naval Institute, turned Tom Clancy into a techno thriller writer from being an insurance salesman. And the rest is, you know, gamer history and all kinds of other things. So um, that was that melding. And I, I think it's all right. I mean, it's a little bit cliche, but it, it kind of it worked because the, the, the initial book sold pretty well. Well, I, I think it worked very well. I remember when it came out, it was wildly popular within the Navy. Uh, and a lot of folks, you know, I was an intelligence officer with a fighter squadron and an air wing, uh, you know, a carrier air wing and had also observed the human element of carrier operations. And and I remember reading your your, your book and thinking, yeah, this really gets it. This the, the characters here are real. Um, the drama, the the weirdness of being on a ship with the 5,000 other people for months on end, you know, you, you really captured it very well. Okay. Um, and and I, I, I'll say that the sequels were also fantastic. In your second book, Punk's Wing, you introduce a female fighter pilot. Talk about her a bit. So Punk's Wing, it started, so let me just back up. I, I, I don't write like, there's no outline, there's no, I don't know where it's going to go. It's kind of like improv, you know, where you just start with, like that show whose line is in any way they'll start the, the host will give you one idea like two elephants in a phone booth with a floaty go and these comedians will do their thing right so that's kind of how i write and so in punk's war it started with what wound up to be chapter one which is the skipper relieves punk and punk thinks he's doing him a favor but actually he knows that an iranian is about to launch and he wants the good deal of intercepting him that he ultimately screws up punk's wing started with chapter what turned out to be chapter four meaning i wrote the first scene which is punk walks into a hangar and there's this wreckage of an aircraft mishap that's sort of put together like a macabre jigsaw puzzle so that was the initial thought but within that as i'm thinking about okay what is this book about so i always wanted to do something about this phenomenon of the first wave of female naval aviators that were sort of force-fed into carrier aviation because, you know, the hue and cry around, um, you know, the tail hook scandal in 1991 and the Kara Hultgreen mishap in 1994 and some other things, the 60 Minutes episode that sort of accused uh, higher ups of ignoring some of the track records of the female aviators who were forced into fighter squadrons, all of that stuff, having flown with a few very talented female naval aviators. I just wanted to do a study of that in, in, in a way that, that I would. And so I introduced this character of Muddy, who got her call sign by on her first FAM-1 um, at the RAG. She got distracted and taxied into the mud. Um, and, and, and that was a pretty dubious start to her F-14 career. But she goes on and, and has a lot of pluck. And uh, she's Academy grad, and she tries hard. Uh, whatever her natural stick and rudder talent is, she overcomes, you know, some of that with just her desire. And so I thought it was a more nuanced view of this phenomenon against this backdrop of it starts with punk on shore duty. And that's the other thing I wanted to prove with punk's wing is because you think if I was just on shore duty, my life would be solved. This being on cruise thing is what is the source of all of my stress and personal troubles and whatever else. But then what you discover on shore duty is actually life's easier when you're underway. And so I also wanted to show that. And as I was writing it, 9-11 happened. And so I held that at arm's length for a few months. And then my agent and my editor at Penguin Putnam, because now I left Naval Institute Press and I was writing for Penguin Putnam, sort of said, look, there's no way you can ignore this. And so the pivot to get this rag class back to war wound up being 9-11. And I won't spoil it for those who haven't read it, but Muddy is challenged. And uh, the question is, can she hack it or not? So, yeah, I, I don't remember if this line was in the book or if I've just heard you say it a number of times, but you use the phrase, the airplane doesn't care whether you're a man or a woman. And, yeah. and just talk about that for a second. How did that play into the character Muddy's role in the novel? Yeah, so that was something I heard around the Kara Holt Green mishap. 
So I was a RAG instructor when that happened. I've actually done uh, an episode. In fact, it's my most popular YouTube episode, 2.3 million views and counting, um, which surprised me because it's sort of an antiseptic reading of what happened because, you know, I'm benchmarking against other YouTube episodes. And one is this sort of animated thing by some non-American voice and they get it absolutely wrong. And so I just naively enough just started that episode using the bold face procedures, which are the procedures we have to memorize about single engine and angle of attack and don't put the stick, you know, opposite the roll because that'll just exacerbate the roll, all of these sorts of things. So um, during that time frame, a, a, a lot of the uh, stuff was was focused on Kara Hultgren and, and the fact that her, her pedigree maybe uh, wasn't perfect for being a fighter pilot, you know? And, and so I, I just wanted to study that, that time and place and, uh, you know, what is it about the airplane that is challenging? And during the course of that mishap, it was said numerous times to congressional committees, to civilians that ask about it, the airplane doesn't care what your gender is. You know, just like it doesn't care what your race is or what your so, you know sexual uh, orientation is, it doesn't know. <clears throat> and so, the accusation that was made by the old guard was, "You're doing this just because you're trying to create a social outcome. It's a political agenda." And so, unfortunately, the airplane has no idea that that's why you're doing it. And so, it doesn't let a below-average pilot off the hook just because, in this case, she's female. And so that is is what that means with respect to the airplane doesn't know what gender you are. You know, that's kind of the, the truest thing in, in aviation. Yeah. And then I, I think in in your second book uh, in, in Punk's Wing, uh, Muddy works through that. Right. As yeah. you said, you've, you've flown with with top notch women pilots. We we uh, interviewed uh, Pops Papayano, the Top Gun CEO, a couple of years out of Tailhook. Who mentioned women have gone through tailhook and been or through Top Gun, and been some of his best students, and now they've got women on staff out there. The the, the airplane doesn't care. You just have to be good. You have to be competent. Yeah. You have to be you have to be excellent. Yeah. Yes. Now, in in defense of these women, <clears throat> because of this sort of, I mean, revolutions are messy. Yeah. Right? And so, I, I don't want to say this had to happen this way, but um, you know, absent that we may still be wondering if, if women would ever be assigned to carrier squadrons, carrier based squadrons. Um, now I'm not going to let all of the people who made bad choices off the hook with, by saying that, but um, we did figure it out quickly because maybe unlike the Naval Academy that they took a while to fully figure out female integration, like 25 years. Um, Naval aviation had it figured out in about three to five years. Because why? Because otherwise you're going to kill people, you know. Um, and so standards are, they matter. You know, you can't fudge it because if you're scaring the LSOs or if you're doing dumb things because you don't have good head work or if you're behind the airplane, it's going to be known in short order. And there are mechanisms for sidelining aviators that continually show this or even show this more than once. Um, and, and so that's the beauty of particularly the naval aviation system. You know, and we're, we're awaiting the results of this F-35 mishap that occurred on Vincent some months ago. Um, and we'll see what that shows in terms of pilot actions. And even in the face of this fifth generation G-Wiz technology, pilots can still demonstrate bad, bad head work or whatever else. And I'm not prejudging what happened. I'm just saying that the guy or girl in the airplane matters quite a bit. And if that guy or girl doesn't muster up, the system has means of, de of dealing with them. <clears throat> and so this is what we proved once again, uh, during the, uh, the mid nineties, basically is when this was going on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, back to the Naval Institute for a minute. Uh, you've been associated mm -hmm. with this organization for 30 plus years. Uh, next year is our 150th anniversary. Uh, you came on in uh, 2017 and had the idea of, hey, why don't we start a podcast? 
let's interview proceedings authors. And so we started that. And so I thank you for that, for having the idea and helping us get it off the ground. Um, how, how have you seen the Institute develop and what do you think the next steps are that we need to take? So as mentioned, I, you know, first introduced to the Naval Institute, excuse me, <clears throat> by Fred back in, you know, 80, well, my, you know, my dad, I saw proceedings, but then Fred, and then, um, you know, when I was stationed at the Naval Academy for my last tour, I, I was there when the Naval Institute moved from Preble Hall, which is basically on the main side of the Naval Academy grounds, up to where we are now in, in Beach Hall. Um, and so that was the another gear, because now dedicated building and some potential. Um, so as you've said, um, we've done some things in the last five years or so that are really digitally based and, and, you know, we've increased the accessibility to perhaps younger active duty personnel of the sea services and that sort of thing. But what I discovered when I came aboard the, the team uh, in 2017 was the history and, and this is, again, we talk about Dennis Cliff. Dennis, uh, you kind of, when you check in, you got to go by Dennis. And, and he, he, you know, first quizzes you and then lets you know what the heritage is. And it's brilliant from 1873 on. All the bylines and proceedings are the names on the buildings of fleet installations worldwide. And when you first feel, and then as a member of the staff, endeavor to unlock the power of that heritage and then make it relevant to today. Now it's a world beer. There's no not-for-profit. There's no professional association that rivals the Naval Institute simply because of those facts. And so I think what we've done and what you guys are going to do uh, in the wake of my departure is harness that reality and then unleash it in effective ways like you said, the podcast, we had, in fact, some folks sort of, you know, I say fought us, but, you know, they didn't love the idea of it. Um, and, and we just kept doing it. And little by little, the per episode stats went up. And then the phone calls were coming to the CEOP daily from people like, I heard it on the podcast. And so word of mouth started, uh, you know, having its own impact. And, and finally, it's a thing, you know, and we monetized it from time to time. And, it's also a great way to get service chiefs and influencers and ideators, you know, to, to talk to us and sometimes ask him to write as a heavy lift. So it's like, okay, how about just come on StreamYard and talk to us for an hour or 45 minutes, you know? So that's very cool. You know, the CTO and the, the digital team has redesigned our sites and we have newsletters and we have social media footprint, which is gigantic. Again, world beater, USNI News, what Sam Legron and his team does and have done since 2012. World beater, they punch above their weight class. Very small team that has impact beyond that fact. So all of these things against a peer threat that's emerging and against a world that is rife with uh, potential for conflict. You know, we're talking about Ukraine, like you were talking about this morning. China, Wagner, Taiwan. We're talking about, you know, there, all of the things that are happening. Yes, the Ukrainians are on the march in the Northeast, but what's the end game here? You know, there's no such thing as an off ramp for Putin, as you know, better than I do. So, you know, there's a carrier in the Adriatic. There are carriers and amphibs in the Far East. As you said, the Seventh Fleet commander is going to speak in a couple of weeks. Um, so only the Naval Institute can harness all of this information and then present it in a 21st century way. So we just nibbled at it, you know, and, and, and I'm just very excited to watch. And you mentioned the conference center, you know, uh, that was a game changer. Uh, that was, you know, our CEO's Pete Daly's brainchild and, and built it during COVID. And it's brilliant. If you're in Annapolis, please come by. Yeah, come visit um, and check it out. You know, the street view does not do it justice. It's, it's really much bigger than it looks like from curbside. Um, you know, 460 arena, terraces, meeting rooms, breakout rooms, just the power to convene was one of Warden's original mission elements. So it's all there. 
And now the team's talent level has just risen from the young guns that are running the digital look like Heather, our producer, that's managing this program and others like her. And then, you know, you and your deputy, Bill Bray, and so forth and so on. I mean, it's just brilliant. Some of the programs that we're doing outreach to current midshipmen, both ROTC and service academies and fleet units. And you've mentioned the events, you know, so, you know, it's just, it's all there. And now people just have to become aware. Cause I think once you're aware of it, a, you're like, how come I didn't know about this before? And then you're, I don't want to say hooked. That's like an over yeah. that's hyperbole, but you're definitely looking for the US and I news newsletter. You're waiting for your sort of proceedings to show up in your mailbox and you're watching either in person or online our events when they happen. Yeah. And, and thanks to our listeners who have, as you said, uh, word of mouth have shared this show, right? Who tuned into the, well, we have two or 300 people who listened to the first episode, I think back in fall of 2017. For which we were mocked. Yes. <laughs> of course we were. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we're getting there. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we're, we're running out of time here, but I just want to ask, uh, you know, for you, what, other than your YouTube channel, which is going gangbusters, which, you know, huge, huge, um, you know, BZ to you for that. That's just an, it's an amazing channel. Uh, what's, what's next for Ward? You got another novel coming? Um, well, the demand signal of the YouTube channel has, is why the books were republished by the Naval Institute Press. I'm very proud to have the trilogy completely in the Naval Institute stable because originally it was just Punk's War was a Naval Institute Press book and the other two were not. And so now all three of them are Naval Institute Press titles. Um, so yes, I'm working on Punk 4 um, and uh, I don't quite know what it's about. It does start with a hearing um, and one of the Congress uh, people is Muddy. Muddy is now like a Mikey Sherrill uh, kind of uh, lawmaker. Wow. And he's kind of grilling Punk and Punk is now a four star um, and he's been caught wrong place wrong time kind of a fat leonard ish i'm thinking calling it chubby chuck but maybe that's too much on the nose <laughs> um and then it just goes on it's like what's what does a four star like you know a, a fleet commander or or, or a, you know pack fleet what is what does sam paparo do you know and and, and uh, i don't think we've ever seen an intimate study of that in a way yeah. that I can do through a novel, right? And so that's kind of what it's about. And there'll be some Far Eastern intrigue and other sort of things. And of course, there's a China piece, there's a Taiwan piece, Second Island chain, all of this is in there. So that's happening. But really, what else am I going to do? The channel is pretty much a huge demand signal. I mean, I was working on an episode right before we jumped on this. Um, the analogy I will give you, and, and uh, then I'll let, let us press here, um, is it's trying it's kind of being a youtuber is kind of like trying to be a golf pro right so you have good days and bad days good weeks bad weeks so do not fall in love with the big number you know so june for instance i had a big month because of top gun maverick coming out and then the month after that it was like one third of what i did in june and so don't get bummed out by the low number right just i guess this is aristotle right or or is it Socrates? <laughs> live on the means right just just stay yeah. over the current episode try to make it great and then launch it and whatever happens happens and then press on to the next thing so um i'm loving it you know i mean here i am in in my studio uh and and i'm able to do this uh pretty much all day long um and that's a gift I started this experiment as a way to see what we could do with the Naval Institute YouTube channel. And it, it took over my life, you know, and I, I thank you and, and Admiral Daly and everybody else there for allowing me the sort of graceful glide path to walking away. Um, it didn't have to be that way. Uh, once it took over, the Naval Institute could have easily said, uh, OK, either you concentrate on this or you do that, you know, and it's the old I'll, I'll help you with a lot more free time get out of here. Right. And we didn't do that. Um, and uh, as a result, I was able to get my legs under me um, before I finally walked away. It was basically five months notice. And as you mentioned, tailhook uh, that we just got back from was my last evolution um, as officially on the Naval Institute team, but I'm not going very far. I kind of consider myself as an emeritus 
uh, member of the staff, and I'm here for whatever uh, makes sense with respect to events or whatever else happens uh, in the future. So I will, I will be wandering around the halls just like that guy in high school who complained about high school until he got out, and then he's back at high school, like going, I'm so glad I'm not here. You're like, well, why are you here then? Right, that guy. I'll be that guy. Ward Carroll. Emeritus Naval Institute. So I'm going to ask this question because uh, some some folks, including me, don't exactly know what the there's a YouTube plaque over your left shoulder. What what does that signify? Yes. Yeah, that's my hundred thousand subscriber. They call that a a, a, a play button, um, and so that's my hundred thousand subscriber button. I'm very proud of that that one. Nice. Um, and then you don't get another one until you hit a million. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm currently at 290, almost 291. I should hit 291 today. Wow. Another thing I obsessively hawk on the back end of the creator metrics that you get. The dashboard is very granular. It can actually drive you crazy. Um, but, yeah, that's that's my play button. Um, and, uh, yeah. 100, that, 100K. Uh, there you go. 100, that was for 100K, yeah. Yeah. Well, shipmate, we're out of time. I can't thank you enough for all you've done for me, for the Institute, for our, our greater team. Uh, you've already said you won't be a stranger, so I know you won't be. You'll be wandering the halls and uh, your your Naval Academy class reunion is coming up in a couple of weeks. And you're hosting some of that here at the Naval Institute, which is awesome, just like my class did. Uh, good luck with that uh, YouTube thing, by the way. Sounds like it's going well. For our listeners, if you enjoy the show, like us and share our channel with your friends. Become a member of the Naval Institute. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. And until next episode, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute. We'll catch you next week.